what does it take to build a plugin and actually bring it to the market? This is a question that I've been wanting to answer and do a video about for a very long time. And there are many reasons why, but here are just three of them. The first reason is that people email us all the time and they say, I need a developer to build my plugin. What a lot of people don't realize is that it normally takes a team to actually develop a plugin and the plugin development part of creating a plugin and bringing it to the market is actually just a small part of a larger pipeline of things that need to happen in order to make a successful plugin. I'll talk a little bit more about that later on in this video. The second reason why I'm doing this video is because I've been noticing this trend recently of YouTubers and influencers who have been going out of their way to make unnecessarily negative and harsh reviews of audio plugins. And I think that that's unfortunate. I've even seen some reviews where the reviewer strongly implies that the developer is this money hungry con artist who's predatory and doesn't care about their customers. And while I do agree that there are some out there who don't deliver the right value for the money that they charge, the vast majority are very passionate developers who really care about their customers' interests and really care about creating a solid audio software product. The third reason that I'm making this video is for the developers who are actually thinking of starting their own audio plugin company. So we get questions in our community on Discord all the time about what it takes to actually build your own company and release your own product. These are some of the key areas that any plugin developer would need to think about. And I'm hoping that this video can help raise awareness of what it takes to actually release your own product. So a little bit about my background and experience. I've actually built an end-to-end -end plugin development agency for people who want to build and release their own audio plugins without the weight of needing to build your own software company. If that's something that sounds interesting to you, check out our development services in the description below. Before we start, I'd like to give a shout out to any plugin developer who has actually managed to go through this journey and get their product into the market. It's a huge accomplishment and I'm hoping that as a community we can start pulling away from this negative energy that we've been seeing on social media lately and find more ways to encourage and support one another. So here are seven areas to consider if you're thinking about building and releasing an audio plugin. The first area is managing a team and the communication that goes around that. So a lot of times you need a team to actually build an audio software product. It's very rare that you find what I call a unicorn developer, uh, which is a developer that actually knows about the full stack of audio software development from the digital signal processing algorithms to the user interface uh, and all of the things that go around uh, audio development. A lot of times you have a team, so you may have one person who's actually writing and responsible for the digital signal processing or DSP algorithms. So many times that could be a specialist. All this person does is just write DSP algorithms. Uh, then you have other developers that specialize more in user interfaces. So a lot of people don't know this, but user interfaces can be very challenging to integrate. Most developers want their audio plugins to be cross-platform, meaning that they can release those on both Windows and Mac operating systems. Something as simple as displaying a font may be completely different on Mac as opposed to Windows because they have different rendering capabilities. Another key person that you need on your team is a great software engineer who just understands the nuances of audio software development. So. C++ is the language that we use to create audio plugins. And anybody that knows C++ knows that there are a lot of nuances to it. And when you start talking about audio programming within that subset of C++, there are even more nuances. Uh, so things like thread synchronization, lock-free programming, those are a few phrases that you'll hear around the way if you're getting into audio software development. And you need a specialist who really understands how to manage all of these things. Many times these individuals want to occupy their specific areas of audio programming. So the majority of the time, people who write DSP algorithms and that are great at it don't want to be concerned with creating a enticing user interface and vice versa. Uh, there are many developers that I've worked with that know all about best uh, practices for audio software engineering, but they don't know how to write 
DSP algorithms. So that's why I say a lot of times you really need a team of at least two or three people to be able to create a compelling audio plugin. And notice that up to this point, I've only talked about the software development team. I would hope that we wouldn't expect the software development team to actually design the user interface. A lot of times we have a graphic designer who specializes in audio software products who would be able to sensibly lay that out and also be able to create a compelling user interface that looks like something that people would actually want to use. But hold on, who's going to actually decide what the graphic designer needs to design and what the vision for this plugin is going to be? And how is this going to be communicated amongst the various members of the team? So a lot of times you have some type of project manager who is sitting in the middle of this fray and they're like the conductor of the, uh, of the team, basically making sure that everybody is working in sync and that things are getting delivered on time, communicating uh, what assets need to be given from the graphic designer to the developer and be given in the right format and the right size and resolution that the developer needs to actually be able to integrate the plugin all of this is a big symphony and it normally takes a couple members to actually be able to do this successfully. Uh, this is not to say that there are some very passionate software developers that are able to do this with uh, sometimes even by themselves but or with a few friends, but many times this takes a dedicated team to accomplish and to actually do successfully. Some other important team members may include quality assurance people who actually test the plugin to make sure that it works as you intended it to, and sound design, people to create compelling and amazing presets for your plugin. Wow, after all that, I can't believe that I'm only on area number two. So area number two is DAW, operating system, and plugin format specific bug fixes. So for those who don't know, DAW or DAW stands for Digital Audio Workstation, and I'm referring to applications such as Ableton Live, Logic, Reaper, Pro Tools, and so on. And by plugin formats, what I mean are the different audio plugin formats, such as VST3, AU, which stands for Audio Unit, AAX, and CLAP. So I'm not going to get too far into the technical weeds on this one, but I hope you can trust me when I say that each DAW has its own way of processing audio. So there may be times where developers create a plugin and it may work fine in Ableton Live, it may work fine in Logic, and then in FL Studio there's something that happens where for some reason maybe it crashes when you hit a particular button or that the audio stutters when you do a certain thing. Uh, so developers need to spend a lot of time to work out particular uh, bugs that may be specific just to the DAW. Sometimes those bugs may be specific to just a particular DAW on a particular operating system. Uh, and also sometimes those bugs may be specific to one particular plugin format. In the audio software development world, a lot of us use a plugin framework called Juice. Juice is basically this abstraction that sits above uh, all of the plugin formats and the, uh, the different operating specific ways of handling audio and visuals. So it's this way that you can write your code once and deploy it to multiple operating systems and multiple formats. But sometimes uh, there are bugs that may be specific to AAX or to the audio unit format for some reason that we need to go in as developers and we need to fix those. It takes a lot of time and it takes a lot of testing. So uh, please show appreciation for plugin developers for the amount of testing and work they need to do to make sure that their plugins work across all DAWs, all plugin formats, and all operating systems. And if your favorite plugin developer happens to be releasing AAX plugins, be sure to give that person extra kudos because it does take significantly extra effort to be able to develop AAX plugins for Pro Tools. The third area is piracy protection, registration systems, and setting up trial periods. So now that you're starting to see how much effort it actually 
takes to build a plugin, naturally developers want a way to encourage customers to buy the plugin and be able to give them trial periods to test the plugin out before buying. Once again, I'm not going to get too far into the technical weeds with this, but plugin developers, of course, want to protect their plugins and the systems that you can use to do that range from something with quite light security to the most stringent measures possible to uh, encourage customers to buy the plugin. With those systems, there can also be varying levels of difficulty to actually integrate and use those systems. This actually relates to the fourth area that I'm going to talk about, which I will call infrastructure. There are two different areas that I want to talk about when it comes to infrastructure. Uh, the first relates to the last area that we were talking about with plugin registration in that if you have a registration system set up, you're going to need to have something set up on your website that's going to be able to communicate between your plugin and your website to ensure that a customer's registration key is valid and authorize it for use. This would normally be part of a larger infrastructure on your website where you would have a shop front with an e-commerce system where you could actually sell the plugin. This could potentially include a portal where customers would be able to log in, see how many products they've activated, if they could get one of those activations back because they've switched computers, be able to update their software and so on. Then there's this other part of infrastructure that a lot of people don't know about or don't really consider, which is what we call a CI or continuous integration pipeline. So if you want to be able to sell your plugin and for customers to be able to download the plugin and install it on their system, then you've got to create installers. Uh, so installers are a way that it will take the various files that you've created for the plugin, make sure that they're in the right place so that the plugin can actually be used. But before you're able to do any of this, you need to code sign and notarize your installer so that when a customer tries to install your plugin on their system that it doesn't show up as a potential virus and that it is basically certified as safe to install. On Windows, it'd be going through a company like Sectigo to receive this certificate. And on Mac, it would mean enrolling in the Apple Developer Program where your installers would get uh, code signed and notarized and then sent over to, uh, so to make sure that the Installers are actually safe and free from viruses uh, before you're able to actually distribute those and those are able to be installed on other people's computers. Another thing is that you're going to need separate build machines to be able to build the installers for Windows and Mac. So if you have a Windows machine, you would not be able to create a Mac installer. So you need separate build machines to be able to actually create your executables. Now, wouldn't it be cool if once you had that process all figured out that you'd be able to just run it through this process and it would automate all of these steps for you? Well, that is what a CI pipeline does uh, amongst other things. So a CI pipeline can be set up to run the different build machines to actually build your installers, put them in a predefined location uh, where people can download those. Uh, also code signing and notarizing your installers as well. So this starts getting a little bit more technical, but another thing that a CI pipeline could potentially do for you is run test builds every time that a developer pushes code to make sure that your code is building successfully across all of the operating systems. So a lot of times a developer, when they're writing their code, they're writing on a Mac or on, on a uh, Windows laptop, and they're not testing which systems this works on locally. They're just making sure that it's working on whatever system that they actually have to be coding on. When they actually push the code, then uh, what you could do is you could actually have your CI pipeline where it actually makes sure that it is building for all the operating systems that you support and making sure that all of those are building successfully. And if it's not, then it could be sending an automated email back to the developer, letting them know, hey, your uh, build is failing on Mac and you need to fix it before this code can actually be uh, committed and uh, create new installers. I know that I've gone a little bit deep there, but my point is that there are all of these other things that developers need to do to successfully build an audio plugin. Things like code signing and notarizing, being able to create installers, being able to create updates. Uh, all of these things are outside 
writing the actual code for the plugin itself, but necessary steps to actually getting those to market. So please, before you uh, give negative reviews, before you give such harsh criticism, think for a moment about the hard work that it actually takes to even get this plugin out into the world. Okay, the fifth area is a pretty easy one to know about, but a pretty hard one to actually do, which is product vision. So how do you actually even take an idea that you have and create a specification for it or even just get the right people in the room to discuss the vision with to see if it's even possible or even just figure out if it's the type of product that people would be interested in buying sixth area is another area that people know about which is sales and marketing so this is the process of plug-in companies figuring out how much they're actually going to sell their plug-in for, where they're actually going to sell it at, or if they want to go and try to sell it themselves, or if they want to try to go through a distributor. Also, how are they even going to let anybody know that this plug-in exists, especially if they're a new company, uh, reaching out to influencers, YouTubers to do uh, product reviews, doing targeted ads. There are various ways that you can handle sales and marketing and plug-in companies need to figure all of this out. So the seventh and final one is probably one of the more challenging ones for plug-in companies to deal with, which is how to handle customer support. So items like if a customer is having trouble installing your plugin on their system, uh, can you get a person to have a one-on-one -on -one call with that person to be able to help them get that plugin installed successfully or get them a refund? Uh, how do you track bug reports? Uh, if you're getting an influx of bugs that are saying that your plugin isn't working on a certain DAW, on a certain operating system, that can be a challenge sometimes if you don't have a computer on hand that has that operating system. How do you deal with those challenges? How do you handle uh, customers who have feature requests, things that they would like to see in the plugin? So this is another area that can be very challenging for plugin developers. I'm going to mention one other challenge that I haven't actually included in this, which is that a lot of times what can happen is that plugin developers get so caught up in handling these seven challenges that they don't even get a chance to build their next audio plugin because they're too busy trying to support and maintain the plugin that they've just released. So it takes so much effort to actually take one product and deliver it to the market. Uh, I hope that this was a way that uh, you could get some insight into what happens behind the scenes with audio plugin development. And um, for influencers, before you make that negative review, uh, I hope that you can get some insight from this video and uh, just have a second thought about it and just be a little bit kinder uh, to the people that are just out here trying to create quality audio plugins and products. Anyways, uh, if you found this video enjoyable uh, and helpful, please give it a like and subscribe and I hope to see you again soon.